Awesome. Welcome everybody here. It is wonderful to be here, hey? And uh, welcome to all those that are joining online. I think you should be with us by now. And it is wonderful to have you join in this way. Thank you, Jesus, for technology that we can gather as a family from all over the world. eh? Isn't that just such a a privilege? So, I mean, the obvious thing I think we should start with is saying thank you, Jesus, for what you did last night. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, for really true uh, equipping. It's like the Holy Spirit was here and He equipped us. You know, it doesn't matter what ministry is happening. Like we said, we're all students and we're all being equipped. And uh, I just want to steal a line quickly from my good friend, Mike Davies, who will be up later on to teach. Uh, He said this morning, he said, this is not a prayer in form. It's a prayer equip. And it's just such a brilliant line. Sorry, I'm just going to take it. I steal all your stuff anyway, all the time, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not a prayer in form. It's a prayer equip. We're not here to, to go home and go, oh, wow, wonderful. Uh, we know all the theology and the boundaries and the understanding of prayer. We're here to be set on fire again, to count and give ourselves to prayer, which like we were talking about last night, is probably the most important powerful thing we can actually do as believers. Um, So we we are so grateful for that. In a moment, we're going to put up one or two testimonies, which I think are just going to be really good to hear. Um, Why don't we pray really quickly? That's a good idea, hey? Okay, it's more than a good idea. It It is essential, essential. Jesus, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for last night. Thank you for this time that we get to gather in your name, in your name together, that we get to agree with one another and say, Lord, would you build this muscle in us that it would be so strong that we would be those that when you return, you would find faith. You would find faith, Lord, a pure trust a desire, a people that are still seeing miracles and signs and wonders, that are still living in perseverance no matter what is coming against us, that are still planting churches and seeing the gospel all over the world extended. Oh, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I want to just say from the start this morning, the one thing I felt God just really laying on my heart and as we worship just now is, you know, I've, I've just finished reading all four Gospels and just read them all one after the other and we did it as a whole church. And one of the things that really stands out is how often Jesus is saying, listen, it's your lack of faith. Or he's saying, it's because of your faith that such and such happened. Now, when, when I was reading this over and over in all the Gospels, this incredible emphasis on faith, what I realized is that my default position is to rather explain away why something doesn't happen why I didn't see the miracle, why uh, my, my default position is surely I can defend God because he needs my defense and, and explain why maybe in this situation it, something didn't happen or whatever it is. My default position is not, Lord, give me more faith. Lord, impart faith into me. Lord, help my faith to be more pure. You said it's, it's, it's like a mustard seed of faith. And Jesus just, I mean, uh, the one example at the end of Matthew, and there, you can read deep theological significance into this. But as I was reading about that whole weird story of cursing the fig tree, it's a little bit strange. And at the end of that, I mean, I'm sure there is a deep meaning to that in terms of the fig tree and Israel and all of that. But at the end of it, Jesus's application is very simple. His application is simply this. Um, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this I I don't know why we would need to do that, but I mean, things like this and much more. You can even say to the mountains, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. You can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. Now, now immediately, I want to balance in tension, and yet I feel like God's going, and He's been challenging me, going, hold on, be careful, because I want to actually teach you something. I want you to be crying out for something. I want you to be stirred in something. And so from the beginning of this morning, I want to ask us to posture ourselves like that. 
Oh, Lord, we love good theology and we love your word. But, Lord, we want to be equipped in prayer. And we want to be like you, Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so, yeah. Why don't we just play those testimonies? These are beautiful testimonies from around the world. So, yeah. Isn't it incredible that we can talk to God and that He actually listens to us? Uh, and very often he responds uh, to what we have to, to say to him uh, in incredible ways. Uh, I've got a testimony of a time uh, last year when I was in hospital uh, with a bad case of COVID and I really wasn't doing well at the time. My numbers were down. Um, I was really battling to, to breathe. And, uh, and I got a message from the elders in the church to say that they would uh, spend a morning um, praying for me, they'd also be fasting for me on that particular day, uh, really so that the Lord would give uh, some kind of a breakthrough in my life uh, in terms of the what I was experiencing. Uh, and so they did that. Um, and then uh, the very next day, uh, the numbers started changing in a positive way. Uh, everything started looking a whole lot better for me. Uh, and, and I never looked back from that. Uh, the Lord uh, slowly restored me in hospital uh, and then he brought me to a full recovery afterwards uh, and so I'm just so incredibly grateful and, and thankful to God uh, for answered prayer uh, I'm so thankful to those that were faithful uh, in terms of raising me up in prayer at the time as well uh, God is an amazing God my name is Pengiwa Kandu. In my personal prayer life, I would say that uh, I've seen a lot of positive uh, dividends that prayer has impacted in my life. And one of them that I'll talk about is uh, the relationship that I've built with God. And this relationship, I didn't just build it like any other relationship. It is a relationship which is enriched in the Word of God. And every time I'm having a... a, a I'm communicating with God through the Bible. I see God instantly there because as I read the Bible, it's like I'm talking to God. It's a two-way communication. I'm reading this. I'm reading His word. He's talking to me as I pray. He's talking to me. I pray. I'm talking to Him. I read the word. He's talking back to me. So it is. Uh, his word is a mirror to see my life. And whenever I'm going through a problem, when I just go to the Bible and start reading the word. I don't even know how my prayer, how, how that problem goes away. You know, it's like I see God instantly. By the time I'm praying about my problem, the problem has already been answered. And the reason why uh, I enjoy personal prayer is because I'm free to express myself. There are certain situations that I feel uncomfortable to share. There are certain situations that like, I feel ashamed of myself. Like I'll talk about situations like when I come into tens with guilty. I come into change with resentment. I come into change with my past pain. So there are certain things that are just in my hidden area I can't disclose. But once I talk about it uh, with God through His Word and through prayer, I get relieved. I always have peace of mind and inner joy. At the beginning of the year, I was reading two books on the power of praying for your children, and I was absolutely amazed at the stories of how children's lives were changed as their parents prayed and the Lord intervened. It stirred such a desire in my heart to be praying more intensely for my children that I thought for the month of February, I'm going to be praying every day into a different topic or different area of my children's lives. I was so stirred in my heart that prayer really can make a difference in our children's lives that I thought, why not include other parents who join in with me who are also trusting for things in their children's lives to change. I started a WhatsApp group and daily in the month of February, I sent out different topics to pray for every day. I heard so many stories over this month from parents who had their hearts shifted into a place of really believing the Lord can work in their children's lives through prayer. And that's not only on them and what they do that makes a difference in their children's lives. I heard from parents who are trusting for salvation for their older children who have walked away from the Lord. I heard from parents who have been praying for restoration and relationship. Parents who have been praying into attachment insecurities and trusting that the Lord can work on their behalf as they entrust their children to Him. Personally for me, I saw the Lord work in my daughter's heart in marvelous ways this month in a specific area, which is her relationship with the Holy Spirit. She's always been quite hesitant and a little bit scared of the Holy Spirit. That's something I've prayed into and thought about a lot over her life. She's now seven. 
But this man, I saw such a shift in her in just a desire for the Holy Spirit and asking me if she can be filled with the Holy Spirit, if she can speak in tongues, asking questions about the Holy Spirit. And I just was amazed at seeing the Lord answering uh, a very big prayer that we've had for our daughter. I also saw him starting to answer um, another prayer we've had, which is her processing of her adoption and um, how we can help her through that. And just this month, for the first time, she started asking questions that before she hasn't wanted to talk about or we haven't um, been able to dialogue too much about and I was amazed to see the Lord starting to work in this area. Really, really believe that the Lord can make a difference in our children's lives as we pray and um, seeing him doing that in my life and in my children's lives and in the those that we prayed with, the parents that joined in this month, seeing a difference in their lives. Beautiful, eh? So could we, could we just start this time with just lifting our eyes, and just worshiping just uh, remember the who. Remember who we are coming to. And before we speak about anything or pray any prayers today, let's remember who. So, um, yeah, you're welcome to find some space. We want to worship you, Jesus. Our wonderful, wonderful Jesus. You made a way for us to come freely to the Father. And we just thank you for that. So we lift up our eyes. And like you taught us, we just say, Father... Again, we say, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. Awesome. Just lift your voices, just where you are, just lift your voice. Our Father, we bless you. Our Father, we bless you. Just where you are, just bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. We bless you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you. Oh, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love oh. Oh, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you, Jesus. Let's sing it out, we love. Oh, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you, Lord. Oh, we bless you, sing it out. Oh, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you, Lord. Oh, we bless, oh, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you, Lord. Oh. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come quickly, your will be done this. Let's sing that again, our Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come quickly, your will be done the
and yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever um oh we sing it out yours is the kingdom yours is the power
yours is the kingdom and yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen yours is the kingdom yours is the power Where you are, sing out your song. Bless him, bless him, bless him, bless him. Oh, you are worthy. Oh, you are worthy of it all. Oh, we bless your name. Sing out your song. You are worthy, 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 worthy. starting to worship I just I got this picture from God where it was in the Old Testament times and the priests were in the temple and they were praising and worshiping God and just going berserk worshiping his name and I saw above the altar there was a fire and it exploded and it was burning so massively and so brightly and I just felt that God was saying that what we're doing here is a sweet offering and a fragrance unto him and he loves it and he appreciates it Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Yeah, let's just take a moment. Thank you, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Do not be afraid, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Isn't that beautiful? That's what our shepherd says to us. As we approach the Father like this, as we worship him and seek to know how to engage with him and interact with him and work with him, Jesus is going, oh, You don't understand. It's his good pleasure. He so wants to. He wants to. It's not about working your way up. It's about him making himself accessible, available, coming down by his spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Just all across, wherever you're sitting, wherever you are in this building or wherever, just, I feel like, could we just put our hands on our hearts? I just want to invite us. Put our hands on your heart. I want to pray. I want to pray that, Father, would you remove every obstacle to us moving into this fullness of fellowship with you? Every obstacle that inhibits just true intimacy with you. These words, fellowship and intimacy that we use and we throw around and sometimes we we think that we're walking in that. And yet, Lord, you're calling us into something more. We know that. You're calling us into something deeper. And oh, Lord, the joy of that place. The energy in that place, the life in that place. The laying down of lives in that place. The surrender in that place. No fear in that place. (laughs) 
Do not be afraid. The most repeated command in all of Scripture. Don't be afraid. Oh, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for drawing us in so that we will look to you and fear you alone and walk in what you have in your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. We pray for our hearts. We pray for our brothers and sisters' hearts in all of our churches. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to end it there and make space for just more of this beautiful equipping by the word. So once again, yeah, we, I, we don't really need an introduction for Rabbi Mike Davies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, I never know what I'm going to get when I see Mike. This time we got the, the beard and the long hair Mike, which is awesome. Um, it changes frequently. So, yeah, there, there are many things I can say about Mike. He's been one of the biggest influences in my whole life, and so I can really go on about it. Um, but I want to say this, that, you know, to be a teacher that has learned how to really, truly follow the Spirit. Now, that is something special. All of us would easily recognize Mike as a fivefold gift to the church as a teacher. Um, but to be one that has learned how to follow the team that God's put around him and often communicate what God is saying to the team and even to the apostolic better than anyone else could and in it then follow the Spirit is, a, is an incredible thing. And so Jesus, thank you for what is about to come through Mike. Thank you so much for um, his life, Lord, and for all you've taught him through experience all over the world, through leading his, his, his life, his family. We just thank you for all that you've imparted into him, and we just know we're going to drink deeply. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Ryan. It's a real privilege to be here and be part of what I'm trusting is going to be a particularly significant time, not just for many individuals, but for many of our churches. If we can transform how we see prayer, how we practice prayer, how we engage and encourage others in prayer, it's got to change who we are. It's got to. Not that we're terrible in a terrible place, but um, I really have a sense in my spirit that we're coming to, into a really crucial period of history for the gospel, for the world. I don't know if we're living in the end in the end times and end of the end times. We are in the end times. Peter said that. I don't know if we're at the very end. I know I'm getting close to the very end for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll take that. But we've all only got this life. But God has chosen the times and seasons in which we live. And I wonder if we re appreciate just how significant it is that we live in these days, in these places. And then when you get that realization, sometimes you think, wow, that's massive, I'm insignificant. And in one sense you are, accept that. You're one of seven billion people on a little bit of rock in the middle of a universe that is too big for us to comprehend. And yet, you speck of dust, insignificant in yourself, can take on massive significance when you become a vessel for the very creator of that universe. Isn't that incredible? You look at the size of the universe and the one who brought that about with a word is in you. So what should that say about prayer straight away? We are vessels of the almighty God. And that shouldn't puff us up in pride. That should get us to, on our knees in humility because we are worms. <laughs> we are literally creatures of the dust. But he gives us dignity and value and worth. 
And so prayer is important, and we can't do a prayer equip without referring to Matthew chapter, chapter 6, right? So I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, where Jesus teaches us how to preach. And if it goes up on there, that will probably be the NIV or the ESV, and that's great. But I'm going to use a slightly different version this morning, because, you know, preachers and teachers, they like to uh, search through all the various versions there are until they get the translation that suits the point they want to make. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be reading this, this morning from the extra special hyper charismaniac, open it up at the right verse and God will speak to you version. Yeah, not many of you have heard of that. You know, it's, it's, it's so spirit filled, it's so spirit filled that if you just drop it on the floor, it automatically opens at the place where God wants to speak to you. Uh, you've heard the old, you, most of you will have heard the old joke, right, about uh, playing, playing prophecy bingo with the Bible, like God speak to me, and you open the Bible at random. And the guy tried that and it said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. <laughs> and he said, no, I don't like that, I don't like that. Try again. Go out and do likewise. <laughs> no, no, I don't like that, I don't. Try again. Whatever you do, must do, do it quickly. <laughs> Don't play prophecy bingo with your Bibles, guys. But here from the extra special hypercharismaniac version, Jesus said, pray then like this. <sighs> Father God, <laughs> Jesus Spirit Lord, Father Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit God. I'm putting on my prayer voice now so everybody thinks I'm holy God, Father Jesus, Lord. Lord God, Father, Spirit God. Abba, Daddy, Yahweh. I'm throwing some Hebrew and Aramaic in there so I'm really spiritual. Harold, holy be your name, Father God, Holy Spirit, God. Do you want to buy a Honda? Shabba, 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 shabba. I'm going to throw some tongues in there just to prove how spiritual I am. Your kingdom come, and by that, I mean we're living in the tension of the already but not yet. I thought I'd get a preach in because we're in a corporate prayer meeting, and I never get to preach, so this is my opportunity. Your will be done. Especially if, you know, I can twist your arm hard enough to give me what I want. Ah, Father God, ha, Spirit, Lord Jesus, Abba, God, Father, Holy Spirit, Lord. And give us this day our daily bread. Yes, give us our bread. We claim it in the name of Jesus. We pray the blood of Jesus on it. And I mean that metaphorically because I don't want bread with the blood of Jesus literally on it. But I want to throw some cliches in there, some Christian phrases, because I don't quite know what to say, Lord, Father, God. And uh, yes, we're two or three gathered, and I'm going to throw some scriptures in there now, because I can't quite think what to pray next. But I don't want the prayer to be too short, because people will think I'm unspiritual, Lord. And there must be some other things I haven't prayed for, because I know there's 50 people in this room, but I want to cover everything before anybody else gets a chance to pray. <laughs> And forgive us our sins, give us our debts, Lord, as we forgive. No, can we ignore that next line? Because it doesn't suit what I want to do, and that's a bit too convicting, so we'll avoid that next bit. And uh, Lord, Father God, uh, well, I pray, Lord, Father God, that uh, you would not lead us into temptation, uh, uh, especially my brother Ryan. <laughs> With what he's going through right now, I know gossip is a sin, uh, but I enjoy it so much because I'm gonna, so I'm gonna disguise my gossip as a prayer need. <laughs> yeah, and Satan has no power here. We come against every lying, unclean, filthy spirit and power and principality and any other name I can think of because we've got the power and I'm the head and not the tail and the top and not the bottom. And <sighs> Okay, 
Tell me if I crossed the line, will you? <laughs> yeah. I was saying the other night, I know exactly where the line is. It's in my rear view mirror as I've gone past it <laughs> to do it. Okay, I want you to understand, I am not mocking prayer. I'm not even mocking us, really. I want to illustrate from an extreme, silly, stupid, funny point of view, just how weird we often become when we pray. And we end up, you know, we read and Jesus says uh, in Matthew 6, and we'll go back to a normal translation now. <laughs> from verse 5. When you pray, you mustn't be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. He will reward you. That's a promise. As far as I can see here, it's pretty unconditional other than get in front of him and speak to him. And one of the things we touched on this morning just as we were talking before the meeting um, does God always answer our prayers? Does prayer always work? And the answer is yes. I think it always works. It just doesn't always work the way we want. It always answers, and sometimes the answer is no. I've got two kids. They ask me lots of things. The answer is always, we'll see. <laughs> We'll see. They say, you mean no, don't you? Uh, sometimes the answer with God is no. Sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is wait. We'll see. But God will reward you. But in this, he's not saying prayer must always be a private thing. There is a place for corporate prayer. It would be hypocritical of Jesus to say never pray in public because he often prayed in public. But I think the heart of this is, what's the point in trying to show people how spiritual you are in corporate prayer if you never spend any time in private prayer? Because then actually you're not praying for him, you're praying for you. I'm often convicted of that, because I wouldn't, I understand the discipline of prayer, I understand the importance of it, but I'm the guy who wakes up early to pray and five minutes later I'm speaking in tongues again it's, like, it's, it's not easy for me to wake up early and pray it's not easy for me to wake up early and do anything generally but <laughs> but I know that if I can't discipline myself to pray privately I shouldn't be praying publicly in a sense yeah certainly not in a manner that tries and displays how spiritual I am and by the way I do think it's a good discipline to get up early and pray but I don't think you're more spiritual if you pray at 4 a.m. than if you pray at 8 a.m. Let me just put on my Facebook page. I had my quiet time at 4 a.m. this morning and God spoke to me. Now, am I trying to encourage you or am I trying to let you know I was awake praying at 4 a.m.? I don't know. God knows your heart. But you know what I'm saying. And so there's public prayer and there's private prayer, but, but we have to be consistent because prayer isn't about displaying our own spirituality. It's about focusing on him. And when you do pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. We don't need long, complicated, theological prayers. Now, when you're praying on your own in your room, you can pray for as long as you... Pray a long prayer, it's fine. But one of, one of, one of my little bugbears is we'll, we'll have a prayer meeting for a particular situation. Let, let's pray for Ukraine. 
And we get together in a prayer meeting and the first person to pray is, Lord, we want to pray for Ukraine. We want to pray for all the Christians there and the churches there. We want to pray for all the children. We, we want to pray for peace. We want to pray, pray that Vladimir Putin will get saved. Or we want to pray. And then, amen. And you go, okay, well, that's it, guys. Everything's been prayed for. <laughs> And you're laughing because that's happened, right? You've experienced that. You know, one of the most effective prayers in the whole Bible was by Peter when he was drowning. And he said, Lord, save me. He didn't even add, in the name of Jesus. (laughs) What's this? Bang. That's a sacred cow being shot. (laughs) but doesn't scripture say to pray in the name of Jesus yes but not as an incantation not as a spell not as a formula what does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus and there's a number of explanations but the easiest one for me and the one that that I understand is when, when we used to play cops and robbers as a kid, and you're being the cop, we always wanted to be the, who, I always wanted to be the robber, I think. <laughs> okay, but you're playing the cop, and you come, and you knock on the door, and the phrase you would always use, uh, was, use was, open up in the name of the law. Yeah, you've heard that phrase? Open up in the name of the law, and what you're saying is, don't open up because of who I am. Who I am doesn't count. Who I represent is what counts. And what I'm saying to you is I carry the authority of the entire legal system and to resist me is to resist the authorities. And so when Jesus says pray in the name of Jesus, he's not saying add a formula to your prayer. He's saying pray as a representative of me with the authority of heaven behind you. Now if as a cop, If as a policeman, I just knocked on some random person's door because I fancied having a look what was inside and said, open up in the name of the law and compelled them to do so, actually, what authority am I carrying? I'm carrying an illegitimate authority. And not only am I not likely to get what I want, I'm likely to be in trouble with those that I represent. So when Jesus says, ask for anything in my name and it'll be given to you, it doesn't mean I can pull the Jesus card out to get what I want. It means when I pray under his authority in accordance with his will, I will get what I'm praying for because I'm praying in accordance with the will of Jesus. He's not my servant, I'm his. Now I'm not saying it's wrong to say in the name of Jesus in your prayer. I'm saying let's pray with understanding. And with reality, rather than a bunch of mumbled cliches. And again, what I, I, I was asked to kind of speak on some of the things that we do in prayer so that we can pray with more understanding. And, and my fear was this, that in addressing some of the things that we do, it would make us so self-conscious that it would actually inhibit prayer in us. And that's not what I want to do. So what I want to say is this, praying is not about doing it perfectly. It's about doing it. As you do it, you will grow in understanding and maturity and your communication may grow in a deeper and deeper way. Just as my children now, my daughters who are uh, 18 and just about to turn 17, do not communicate with me now the same as they did when they were three. But when they were toddlers and they go, Dada, Bicky, that makes no sense at all. I didn't sit down with them and say, right, the right way to ask for a biscuit. (laughs) And God is your father. He desires communication. And if spiritually all you're capable of right now is Dada, Bicky, he will love that. He'd probably not less happy if you're 18 years old spiritually and going, Dada Bicky. <laughs> and so this isn't about becoming paranoid about how you pray. Actually, I want to release you from paranoia about how you pray. 
And I don't want you to, it sounds like I'm being judgmental about how people pray. Honestly, I don't sit in prayer meetings kind of judging you for your levels of prayer and how accurate and how theological they are. In fact, none of us have a right to judge how another person speaks to their father. So let's just get that out of the way. This isn't about any of us going out of here going, I'm an expert in prayer and I'm going to judge. And when when Mervis suddenly starts praying, I'm going to correct him and say, no, Mike said you mustn't pray like that. Don't you dare do that. Do we have a responsibility to help grow one another? Yeah, but that's very different from being judgmental about it. Somebody else praying, it's them speaking to their father. We should encourage it. And then we get into the Lord's Prayer, which is so profound, and yet we are so familiar with it that it's almost, we can treat it with contempt almost. Familiarity can breed contempt. It's just, oh yeah, I know that. Like we're reading, I can ask Ryan because he's honest, right? Remember Ananias and Sapphira anyway. (laughs) You've just gone through the Gospels. How tempting was it when you got to a passage you knew really, really well and had read a hundred times. How, how tempting was it just to skip over? Yeah? Very tempting, right? Oh, I know this bit. And then when you don't skip over a passage, because, you know, Ryan was born saved, right? <laughs> he came out of the womb speaking in tongues with a halo and everything. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm not. (laughs) But some of those passages you must have read hundreds of times. You've preached on them. You've 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 shown other people and, and provided huge revelation to others from some of those passages. And then have you ever read one of those passages for like the hundredth time and you think, why have I never seen that before? I am so stupid. Because the word of God is more than just a written word on a page. It's more than just information that retain, that we retain. It's active and living. And so we can come to the Lord's Prayer, which when I was little and I used to get dragged to the Anglican church with my parents, and it's like, how many times would we recite the Lord's Prayer? I know the Lord's Prayer. But then I was looking at it for today and some things just popped out at me that I hadn't quite, and maybe I'll, I'll tell you, and you'll think, well, Mike, you're just stupid. But maybe you'll go, wow, I've never seen that either. And the one is this. He starts off with Father, our Father in heaven. Because the foundation first is relationship. And, and Ryan covered a lot of this uh, last night. But it's relationship. And one of the reasons often that we resort to cliches And just quoting, and there's nothing wrong with quoting scripture in prayer. Um, Although God has a good memory, he doesn't forget. One of my other bugbears is when we pray, we say, Lord, uh, just as I was telling you yesterday, I think he remembers what you were telling him yesterday. (laughs) Maybe you're saying that because you want everybody else to know that you were praying yesterday. I don't want to judge your motives, but still. I've gone down a cul de sac again, sorry. But it, 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 it's our, one of the reasons we get into cliches and, uh, and, and things like that is because that's how we work as human beings. When I meet somebody for the first time in the street and I don't know who they are, generally the conversation goes like this Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. Hot day today, isn't it? Yeah. We talk in cliches because we have a very shallow relationship, so our conversation is shallow. Have you ever noticed that that conversation is designed for you not to reveal what's in your heart? You're protecting yourself because I don't know if I can reveal my heart to this person right now because I don't know them. And then as that relationship deeper goes deeper, you begin to have conversations where you begin to express some opinions. And then as it goes deeper, you start to express your feelings. And eventually you get a relationship where you say, are you doing all right? Yeah. How are you really doing? No, actually, I'm not doing okay. 
And it goes deeper and deeper. And so our conversation changes. And one of the reasons our prayer is shallow, perhaps, is because we've got a shallow relationship. The deeper the relationship goes, the less cliche we use. And sometimes, have you noticed this? You can be with somebody that you're really intimate with and say nothing and communicate volumes. And I think in our prayer lives, sometimes it's possible. Mervis, correct me if I'm wrong. To just spend time in the presence of God saying nothing. But he communicates volumes. So one thing... Why, how, do, how do I grow in prayer? I can give you 10 steps to growing in prayer and I'll do a really good preach and I'll, I'll, I'll make it so that it's a wonderful acronym, acronym that spells out a word and, and you go, wow, that was really clever. No, here's the key to growing in prayer, growing relationship. And he said, but how do I grow in relationship? And the answer is, grow in prayer. And scientists have shown, I've shared this, this before, it's a fact. Scientists have discovered that the longer a couple stay married, the more they look like each other physically. It's true. It's true. My wife gets look, better looking every day. <laughs> and it's because... It's because when we are talking with somebody that we know and that we like, we subconsciously imitate. When we're married, we have a similar lifestyle, a similar diet. So as we grow in relationship and intimacy, we become in our tastes, in our vocabulary, and even physically, we grow more into the image of the person that we are intimate with. So if you want to grow in prayer, become more like Jesus. And if you want to become more like Jesus, spend more time in prayer. One of our biggest problems with prayer is we're trying to communicate on a level of strangers with somebody who desperately desires intimacy. But then the next line, and this is what just popped out at me, our Father in heaven, then the next line is, holy is your name. And holiness has two aspects of it. There's what's called God's moral holiness. In other words, every virtue, every goodness, all truth, all beauty, all all love, all compassion is bound up in the person of God. He is absolutely morally perfect. That's a good reason to hang out with him, right? Because we want to become morally better people. We want to become more holy in a moral sense. But the holiness of God also has another aspect, and that's his majestic holiness. The fact, holiness, the, the word holy means separate. And we need to understand that God stands apart from all of creation. Because everything else, you, me, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything was created by God, but God is uncreated. Everything else has a limit, he has no limit. He is unlimited in his presence, he's unlimited in his power, he's unlimited in his knowledge. He he is so powerful that he doesn't, if you, you know the joke, and I'm constantly afraid, afraid of this, like you say something out of line and you get struck by lightning. If that's how God, God worked, I would have been struck by lightning many times by now, most times while I'm preaching. If God wants to kill you, he doesn't have to send a lightning bolt. He doesn't have to do anything. If God wants you to cease to exist, All he has to do is stop supporting your existence. Because you are held together simply by his will. He doesn't have to do anything to destroy you. He just has to stop maintaining your existence. This is the God. And so, Father, 
And, and father deliberately, I think. Father is a unique role in human society. No other role in society carries both responsibility, authority, and love in that unique mixture. But as father, the one who loves you, protects you, the one who desires intimacy, the one that wants to bounce you on his knee, the one if, he, if God had a fridge, your picture would be on his fridge door. And if your prayer was a work of art, it would be that thing, you know, when, when your kids come home and go, Daddy, look what I drew. And you go, oh, that's a nice giraffe. It's not a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's mommy. Oh, yes, I can see. <laughs> Just like mommy. <laughs> but as a parent, why do you love that picture? You don't love that picture because it's a good picture. In fact, as a work of art, it stinks. <laughs> you love it because of who created it. And when it comes to prayer, God doesn't love your prayer because how, of how well crafted it is. He loves it because of who gave it to him. And if, if your prayers were pictures, they'd be on God's fridge door. So he's that. But then is the almighty God, creator of the heavens and earth, the one of whom, and I know this isn't a popular theology these days, the one of whom we should be very, very afraid. And people say, oh, fear of God is just this reverential, no, it's a fear of God. You go, but, but that's contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. The two can exist side by side. And I'll give you two biblical examples to help you grasp this. One is Esther. Esther was married to the king. She had been intimate with him. She knew what it was to be intimate with the king. She knew that in certain contexts, intimacy was what he desired. And then came a time where she knew she had to go before him in his throne room. And she said, I'm afraid because if he does not hold out his scepter, I will be instantly put to death. She understood the power and the authority of the one with whom she had been intimate. And so she did not presume that that intimacy meant they were equals. She understood the power and authority and the fear of stepping out of line before the one who held her life in his hands. And she, but then other times, she knew absolute intimacy. Intimacy and fear are not mutually irreconcilable. And when we come in, in prayer, there are times where we come in prayer as little children that, before a father. There's times where we come as grown-up children before a father and say, Dad, can I have the car keys? There's times where we can remind God of his promises, not because he's forgotten, but it's useful for us to be reminded. And say, God, you promised and my kids do that all the time. Dad, you promise. I'm holding to you to your word. And then I feel like I, I have to do what. And so there's, even as a father, there's different ways we can come to him. But then sometimes we come to him in fear and trepidation on our knees. Almighty God of heaven and earth. And if we get... I'm not talking about paranoia. If, if you get it wrong, he's not going to smack you because God wants you to get it right. But I think, just like my kids, if they come with a certain attitude, Dad, I demand the car keys. Guess what the chances are right now? <laughs> so there's a place, I think, where we can actually, we can come with prayer and say, we claim this. We claim this promise because you promised us. And sometimes we come with, Lord, we ask. Sometimes we come with confidence before the throne, because scripture says we can do, and we come with confidence because, because he's dealt with our sin and our shame and our guilt. Sometimes we come with fear before the throne, not because of our, but because of his power and his majesty. 
So another biblical example of this. And uh, Mervis knows this one well. John the Apostle in John's Gospel describes himself as the Apostle that Jesus loved. He's known as the Apostle of Love. He's the one that at the Last Supper leant against the chest of Jesus. When people preach about intimacy and love and, and, and prayer, they often kind of use this kind of picture. And how many of us would love to have been there just to lean against the chest of Jesus and hear his whispers? And there's a place where we do that in the spirit. There's a place where we do that in prayer, where there's such intimacy that we come to him. Almost, It almost sounds blasphemous, doesn't it? That we mere mortals can come and lay our head on the chest of Jesus and hear the whispers of heaven. But there's a place for that. But that same John, who is known as the apostle of love, who wrote that gospel which is all about love, in Revelation, the same John sees the exact same Jesus, but he sees him in a different context. He sees him high and lifted up, and he says, I fell to the floor as one dead in fear and trepidation of this same Jesus that I knew intimacy with. Jesus is the lion and the lamb. Don't ever forget that he's a lion. And don't ever forget that he's a lamb. And here, it's like Jesus is giving us both. Father in heaven, holy is your name. And I want to help us with something as well, because God is holy and he's perfect. So how can we, you know, and people say he cannot come into the presence of sin. I think that's wrong. I think he can come into the presence of sin. He just doesn't like it very much. Yeah. If he couldn't come into the presence of sin, we'd all be in deep trouble because none of us would be saved. (laughs) But we, we know what we're kind of trying to say when we say that line. But often... You know, we read, who can, come, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And so we come in worship and we come in prayer and we, we suddenly become aware of our own sin and we say, I can't come into the presence of God because of my sin. And that's a lie. You can come into the presence of God with your sin. He doesn't expect you to be perfect to come into his presence. But if you are, if you are aware of your sin when you come into his presence, you better be prepared to deal with it. <laughs> He's very willing actually to come into the presence of sin but then he's very willing to say I'm here so sin must leave so don't wait till you're perfect to come into his presence come into his presence so he can make you perfect and again there's a tension he is making perfect forever those who have already been made perfect so we come into his presence because Jesus is what Jesus has done not our own moral standards We have been made holy, but having been made holy, he's making us holy. Does that make sense? So one of the the reasons why our prayer is stilted sometimes and difficult and, and sometimes feels ineffective is because of a lack of intimacy. Sometimes it's because of a lack of revelation of the majestic power of God. Man, how powerful is God? I can't tell you how powerful he is because he's beyond words, but I can tell you this. He's more powerful than your sickness. He's more powerful than your financial circumstances. He's more powerful than your fears and anxieties. He's more powerful than your sins. He's more powerful than Vladimir Putin. He's more powerful than anything the world has ever seen or will ever see again. And that's the one that wants to communicate with us and display his goodness and his power through us. We're not approaching some doddery old man with amnesia that we have to keep reminding him of things because he's forgotten. And he's not there waiting to have his arm twisted that if we fast long enough and pray hard enough that he'll listen. And another little thing that often happens is we start praying and we're not feeling it. So, you know, Jesus, 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 we're raising our voices now because the louder we pray, the more power our prayers will have. And then if we get really desperate, we'll, we'll, we'll get into tongues. Oh, do you want to buy a Honda? I have a Kawasaki, but I want to buy a Honda. And 
And then let's gather, let's all pray together. And there's a place for praying in tongues. There's a place for raising our voices. But we don't raise our voices because God is hard of hearing. We don't raise our voices so that our prayers will have more power. Some of the most powerful prayers of Jesus went unnoticed in a crowd. He just spoke. And so it's not about formulas and it's not about systems. But here's the deal. When I get passionate, the, the, the level of my voice goes up. Not because you're hard of hearing, but I'm getting passionate. And God doesn't want wet fish prayers. He wants prayers of people who are passionate. He wants the prayers of people who, who will... force themselves into his throne room even though they don't have to you know we've got to hold truth's intention you know so some people say you know uh, the, the veil has been torn we've got free access so all we have to do is just step into his presence and that is true but at the same time you know and, and so people say you know that idea of storming the gates of heaven is a is an unbiblical concept and it uh, there's you know what if there were gates of heaven that were locked and barred, I would storm those gates to get in. And if I get there and I find the wide open, that's great. But that's the kind of passion and determination I want to have. And our problem sometimes is we can't hold tensions. Your kingdom come, your will be done. I'm praying in the name of Jesus. And our problem often is we, we don't believe that the will of God will be done. And here's where it's difficult as a teacher. Because I want to bring balance. Just as, as, as Ryan was touching, I want to bring balance. I, I don't want to bring us to a place where we're praying for a sick person and that person, like Will, went to be with Jesus and we all go, prayer didn't work we didn't, and we try and have some explanation. We didn't have enough faith. We're, prayer worked. Will doesn't mind being in heaven right now. <laughs> really, believe me, he's not bothered at all. <laughs> okay. But in trying to explain that and avoid disappointment and confusion, we often want to bring so much balance. Well, you know, prayer doesn't... All... And in bringing balance, often what we do is we create this massive side exit that gives us a cop-out all the time. And so, we, again, I, I, I don't want us to fall in this thing of, if I pray somebody, God, God will always heal them. But I don't want us to, well, we can pray for some t- s- people and maybe God will heal them. But probably not, because, you know. Then, and the level of your faith, actually, in a sense, isn't what counts. But in another sense, it is. And instead of like being so balanced that we never pray with conviction and we never understand that God is all-powerful, mighty God who wants to do his will on earth, we're so afraid of saying that because we're afraid of like this hyper-faith message. It's like, I think we need a little bit more hyper-faith in us sometimes. But not faith in faith. Faith in God. And I know God is able. And, and, and one of the most powerful statements in Scripture is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when faced with being thrown in the fire, fiery furnace. This, is, this, I think, is an exemplary uh, display of faith that we can learn from. They say, O oh, King, our God is able to save us, and he will, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. So when I want to pray for the sick, I want to say, my God is able. And you know what? There's a good chance that he will. But even if he doesn't. But if we don't know him, that's when we get into trouble. Because there's often times I don't understand why. But when I don't understand why, I have to fall back on my understanding of who. Just as I expect my children. They ask, no, Why? Can't explain. Just trust me. 
I need you to trust me. And sometimes it's inappropriate to explain to our children why. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's good for them to learn to obey without knowing why. And sometimes it's protective of them not knowing why. So when my little daughter was uh, like three years old and we're in a shopping mall and we say, you stay by me, hold my hand, don't walk off. And she'd go, why? Well, you know, there's gangs of people who roam the country kidnapping children and selling them into sex slavery. That's why. (laughs) Would that be the act of a loving father? No. The act of a loving father is, trust me, it's safe if you stay by me. So do we understand who? Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven others. Let's, let's pray the fullness of the heart of God, not just the bit that suits us. And this brings me to my third strand. There's three strands you might have got. Why is our prayer sometimes stilted and difficult? One, we don't have a true concept of intimacy with our Father. Two, we don't understand the glory and power and majesty of the one we're praying to. And third, many of us actually don't really understand the power and effectiveness and privilege that prayer is. For many of us, prayer is an obligation, it's a duty, it's a box that must be ticked, it's something that we feel guilty if we don't do it, and, you know, we, we set our alarm early to have a quiet time and then press snooze, and then we're running late for work and we've missed our quiet time again. Well, that's obviously just me. And I think there is a sense of, there is something where discipline kits in, and even if I don't desire it, I need to do it. There is a sense of discipline. But if I was in the Ukraine now, and I signed up for the army, and they gave me a rifle, I wouldn't go, man, this rifle's so heavy, do I really have to carry it around with me? Man, you guys are so unfair putting this burden on me. And you tell me I've got to have it all the time, that's a bit legalistic, isn't it? Man, you guys suck. (laughs) Until the enemy appears over the hill and then, where's my rifle? Where's my rifle? (laughs) If the enemy appears and you don't know where your rifle is, it's a bit late. And prayer is not an obligation. It's not a weight we have to carry. It's not a legalistic duty. And by the way, get out of your head. Anytime where people are talking about discipline, That is not legalism. The word, oh, that's legalistic. That's just an excuse for many people to be disobedient, lazy, and ill-disciplined. But prayer is not a burden or an obligation. It can be a burden, but it's a burden we can carry with joy because it's a yoke that the Lord puts on us. But primarily... Prayer is a privilege. Prayer is a weapon. Prayer is something that when, and I think most of us, when we get into into particular circumstances, we're desperately crying, where's my prayer? Churchill famously said there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. (laughs) When the shells start flying and in your fear of your life, even an atheist will pray. By the way, you do know there are no dead atheists, right? Think about it for a second. There are no dead atheists. Some of you are only catching up now. If you don't get it, ask me later. But prayer is a privilege, and we shouldn't be keeping it until the emergency. Prayer is not an emergency break glass. Prayer is a privilege that we have on an everyday basis to come into the presence and speak with Almighty God. And actually, one thing many of us don't realize is that every day is a crisis. Every day is a crisis, actually. And you're just unaware of it often because of the grace of God. I'm sure one day we get to heaven and God will will show us a film roll of our life 
where the angels are evident and we'll realize every one of us should have been dead a hundred times over, but for the grace of God. How many of us came to Christ because of a praying mother or a praying grandmother? Faithful, some faithful family member who prayed for us for 20 years. And you know, if I, this is the last person on earth to get saved. And one day we come into the presence of God, we surrender to him. And how did that happen? Because somebody was praying. I'm a teacher, I'm supposed to give us all the theological kind of understanding of what prayer is. The 10 steps to more effective prayer. There's only one step to effective prayer. And it's in the book of Nike, chapter 1, verse 1. <laughs> if you feel ill-equipped, even if you feel unwilling, if you feel you don't have the words, just do it. And that's what I'm going to leave you with. There may be obstacles, and be aware of the obstacles. But the only advice I can give you, just do it. Thank you. Oh, so good. In a moment, we're going to take a break. Um, but just, let's just close our eyes for a second. Hmm. I think as Mike was talking, um, many of us would have experienced a sense of, I really want to know him more. I really, this intimacy, I, I, I'm suddenly aware that there's so much more for me in intimacy. I'm suddenly aware that my view of God has been limited it's, I, I thought it was big. I thought I knew some stuff, but I'm, I'm suddenly aware like, I don't, I don't know at all. Kind of like Job, like this is what God should do and should have done and ask and why did this happen and what, this, how could he have done that? And, and God just shows up at the end of the book and just says, this is who I am. I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell you about who I am. I'm not going to give you an explanation at all. I'm just going to give you a revelation of who I am. And he just bows to that. And it feels like for some of us, it's like we need to be stirred to go, oh, I so desire that intimacy again. If I'm really honest, there's, it's become traditional and I'm missing Jesus from, because of my own tradition. And for some of us, oh my goodness, I don't know if I see him properly anymore. And I'm so into explanations that I've, I've, I'm, I'm lacking in revelation of this God. And so right now, I want to say to those who say, I desire more intimacy. You know, probably the biggest thing, the, 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 the way to respond if you say, I need intimacy, I want to use the word honesty. Can we just be very honest right now? Just be honest. It's not about the right words. It's honest. It's this is going on right now. And wherever you are, just respond like that. Just be very honest. Don't try and make yourself look better before him. He sees everything as it is. Don't try to show him the good stuff. Don't run away from him because of the bad stuff. We're coming to you just so honestly. If we live in the light, live in truth, we will have true fellowship. True fellowship. Oh, we just want to be so honest. We suddenly realize as Mike talks, so much of what we do, Lord, is, is more about us and how people look at us and 
about coming across okay or whatever it is, God. And I, we just pray right now, would you strip away? Would you help us to do the stripping and strip away and just go, we're we just going to get really honest with you right now, Lord. Just get honest with him. Maybe you've been stirring yourself up and quoting scriptures and that's beautiful, but if you're really honest, you've actually just been hiding how you really feel right now. Maybe you've been hiding that you're actually having a crisis of faith in a certain area and you need to be very honest before him and say, I just want to come to you in that space. Maybe there's been some deep disappointments. Just be very honest with him because honesty is going to lead to intimacy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And it's not going to end there. It's not going to end with us having the final word. It's going to end with the Father embracing again. <laughs> so thank you, Father. Embrace us. Please. And Lord, would you right now lift up our eyes and our vision? Oh, lift it up, lift it up to the one who is over it all, who holds all things together by the power of his word, who sustains every atom, every molecule in this entire universe, sustained by the power and energy of God. And for you, God, that is nothing. It is nothing. The God who has no problems, but only plans, and only the power to fulfill those plans. Thank you, God. God, we repent for explaining, trying to explain away, trying to in some way defend you. We want to repent of that, Lord, and we want to say, oh, Lord, please, increase our faith. I think all of us here say very we believe you, Lord. We believe in you. And we believe what you say. But very often, we really don't have faith. We don't trust. Because we, we're not seeing you as you are. So we just thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Cool. Ten minute break, eh? Or even eight minutes. So, uh, what's that? 11.30. So it's just a run to the loo break and back, okay? Cool. 10.30, okay, 10.30, sorry. <laughs>